Carnap's insistence on such a sharp distinction between synthetic and analytic questions, or more or less equivalently, between internal questions, decidable in principle within a given linguistic framework, and external questions involving the choice of one such framework over another. Uh, Car Carnap's insistence on this does not rest, following Klein's picture of Carnap, on the desire to explain or secure the special epistemic status of logic and mathematics. That's not what Carnap's doing. It rests, rather, on a desire systematically to avoid metaphysical pseudo-problems once and for all by appealing to precisely the distinction between internal and external questions. Thus, for example, the choice between classical and intuitionist logic for the language of science involves no substantive issue at all for Carnap, and in particular no metaphysical issue, but merely a practical choice that can only be settled, in turn, on the basis of long-run scientific fruitfulness balanced against the desire to avoid possible inconsistencies. At the end of Two Dogmas of Empiricism, while applauding Carnap for this pragmatic attitude, Klein famously goes on to criticize him for continuing to maintain a boundary between the analytic and the synthetic. In, repudi in repudiating such a boundary, Quine says, he espouses a more thorough pragmatism, unquote. There is no doubt that Pat agrees with Quine on this point. This is already clear in the passage from Representation and Invariance, already cited, and it's now in, in, in number four of your handout, maintaining, quote, in Pat's words, there is no theoretical way of drawing a sharp distinction between a piece of pure mathematics and a piece of theoretical science, directly against Carnap's view. A more illuminating example, however, of his fundamental divergence from Carnap here emerges in Pat's substantive discussion of Carnap's logical approach to the foundations of probability, which culminates in representation and invariance in a characterization of Carnap's original unique confirmation function based on the measure M star, by a representation theorem, page 194. Pat concludes with a number of critical comments after this, the most important of which, for our purposes, is the last, which expresses Pat's skepticism concerning Sharp's distinction between Carnap's sharp distinction between two different concepts of probability, one being analytic and the other being synthetic. Synthetic value of frequency, analytic degree of confirmation. Here, Pat mildly expresses a skepticism, which has behind it a lot of ammunition. This, I think, is perhaps most incisive criticism of Carnap's whole logical linguistic approach to the subject. Why? Carnap had originally introduced his distinction between two kinds of probability in the late 1940s as a way of attempting to dissolve once and for all what he saw as a typically fruitless metaphysical dispute about the true nature of probability between Harold Jeffries, representing degree of confirmation, and Richard Formesis, representing long run relative frequency. Although Carnap expanded his frame of reference in the 50s to include, among others, both the statistical likelihood approach of R.A. Fisher and the Bayesian approach of Bruno D. Finetti, the point of past skepticism, at least as I understand it, is that some of the most interesting, more recent work in the field involves entangling the two concepts that Carnap wants to keep apart in ways that entirely escape Carnap's framework. For on the one hand, the deep mathematical investigations inspired by Poincaré's method of arbitrary functions for analyzing the chaotic, chaotic behavior of deterministic dynamical systems, much of it carried out here at Stanford by Joe Keller and Percy Diaconis, and Pat has a very substantial and wonderful discussion in his chapter on probability of this work, shows precisely how certain classical long-run relative frequencies, that is, limited relative frequencies, such as those underlying the probability of heads in tossing a coin, emerge from the symmetries of the visual situation in these deterministic systems. And on the other hand, some of the most interesting modern Bayesian approaches involved interpreting distinguished measures like Carnap's M star as precisely objective propensities, here reflected by the assumed symmetries of such measures. These measures therefore appear as nothing more nor less, from this point of view, than privileged priors, prior probabilities, adopted on the basis of certain empirical assumptions concerning the underlying dynamics. 
Pat mentions that explicitly in the section of Carter. This undermines the philosophical motivations for Carnap's logical linguistic approach. The guiding ambition, remember, was to develop a platform upon which the scientific philosopher could stand while simultaneously carrying out two distinct aims. To cooperate with applied mathematicians in developing appropriate mathematical frameworks for articulating and testing empirical scientific theories, and at the same time, to ward off fruitless metaphysical disputes by systematically distinguishing between internal and external analytic and synthetic questions. This is why, in the present case, Carnap insists on a logical linguistic approach to probability. It now appears, however, from the remarks I made before, summarizing the different parts of what Pat says in his book, that Carnap's approach interacts only weakly with ongoing mathematical research. And in connection with his sharp distinction between the two fundamentally different concepts of probability, thereby fails to engage with some of the most interesting recent developments. One might then reasonably harbor the suspicion, more generally, that this is also true of other attempted applications of Carnapian Wissenschaft's mode, including to the so-called crisis in the foundations of mathematics of the late 1920s and early 30s, that was the, caused by the paradoxes and intuitions and so forth, to which Carnap was originally responding in logical syntax of language in 1934. My final question, then, is what does Pat put in place of Carnapian Wissenschaft's movie? The answer is a version of pragmatism, but one that is, again, completely unprecedented and unique. In particular, it has very little in common, in the end, with what Quine calls his, Quine's, more thorough pragmatism. For what Quine comes up with is an extremely broad brush version of philosophical naturalism and empiricism, featuring a physicalist ontology and a vaguely holistic picture of empirical scientific methodology. And this version of philosophical naturalism and empiricism, as I said at the beginning, is paradoxically wholly uninterested in the details of virtually all extant empirical science as it is practiced. What Pat puts in place of Quine's hazy holism, to use my friend Mark Wilson's apt phrase, is an astonishingly detailed engagement with real empirical science in all of its variety and complexity, from the level of abstract mathematical foundations to that of the most concrete empirical applications. Pat's focus, to be sure, has been on the mathematical sciences, beginning with the physics in which he majored as an undergraduate. But his view of this physics was always of a science distinguished more by the complexity and subtlety of its interaction with empirical data than any special foundational character again, whether ontological or epistemological. His position as a military meteorologist during the war naturally encouraged such an attitude. We sh he doesn't, we shouldn't be misled by deep thinking physics as a model of precision and perfection, not if you, it's meteorology that you're doing. Meteorology is in theory a part of physics, but in practice more like economics, especially in the handling of a vast flow of non-experimental data. As I understand him, therefore, Pat sees even our best mathematical science as proceeding entirely without foundations, whether ontological or epistemological again, and also without any claim to ultimate truth. Mathematical or axiomatic foundations, by contrast, are quite a different story. For this enterprise, from Pat's point of view, has less to do with securing our situation against future uncertainty than with developing entirely new concepts at junctures where we are quite unsure of the right direction in which to go next. As in the attempt to develop a satisfactory mathematical psychology, for example, or to appreciate the tension between quantum, quantum mechanics and relativity created by the phenomenon of deltaic entanglement. Pat's version of pragmatism is thus essentially pluralistic, with no particular approach singled out as definitive. The enterprise of modern science, accordingly, is entirely tentative and continually open-ended towards the future. Here's another quote from Pat, uh, and he says, we have to realize that <coughs> the highly schematic character of modern scientific knowledge, the tension created by a pluralistic attitude toward this knowledge, and skepticism about achieving certainty, is not, in my judgment, removable. Explicit recognition of this tension is one aspect of recent historically-oriented work in the philosophy of science that I like, 
Pat's reference to historically oriented work leads me to my last observation. Namely, that Pat's version of scientific pragmatism also contains an important place for detailed study of the history of science and indeed of the relationship between the history of science and the history of philosophy, figuring Aristotle, William James, and others. Pat's conception therefore essentially involves a very long-term historical perspective together with a broad appreciation of the surrounding intellectual context. This comes out most clearly, perhaps, at the very end of the second part of his intellectual autobiography, reporting on a conversation with the historian of astronomy, Noel Fairnall, one of Pat's favorite historians. This is my last quotation. It's long, I'll just go ahead and read it. After the conversation, Pat says, I tried to push a pragmatic theory, looking at the broad history from ancient astronomy to Kepler, to show how many concepts that were important to Babylonians for making omens and the like, and later many aspects of Greek thought as well, were simply pushed out of the way and ignored. But the varied and detailed observations made by the Babylonian astronomers and used by Ptolemy more than 500 years later are even of some use today. Ptolemy's own central work was preserved in tradition of a millennium and a half span, leading up to Kepler, and including, of course, the less important work of Copernicus. <laughs> less important than Kepler or Ptolemy. In this long period, two important things were preserved. The observations reaching back to Babylonian times and many of the Ptolemaic methods of computation, which Copernicus himself continued and were only changed by the new astronomy, as Kepler called what he introduced. The whole subject was then given a much greater perfection by Newton with the introduction of gravitational dynamics. But much of what Kepler and Newton did rested on the shoulders of these observational and calculational giants of the distant past. It is this that is pragmatic, keeping the useful and letting go of the rest. Note that there is no hint of convergence towards any ultimate truth in this description. Just the ever, rich, ever richer accumulation of empirical data and the development of ever more powerful methods of computation for predicting and accommodating such data based on whatever mathematical models are presently most useful. Nor is there any systematic way of drawing the limits of scientific knowledge and placing fruitless metaphysical controversies, controversies forever outside this boundary. Such controversies, if Pat is right, will simply be let go on pragmatic grounds as the observational and mathematical progress distinctive of modern science continues. But scientific philosophy still remains. A scientific philosophy for our own time. Thank you.